A person's every move is executed by the constant instructions produced by the nervous and endocrine systems. While the nervous system sends lightning fast electrical signals called action potentials to target cells and organs, the endocrine system uses a slower and a more wider scale approach to signaling. The endocrine system secretes chemical signals called hormones into the bloodstream which then travel to nearby or distant target cells and organs. The results are long-lasting widespread effects. As the messenger molecules in the endocrine system, hormones play an essential role in driving changes in behavior, anatomical structure, and physiological processes to allow an organism to grow, survive, and reproduce. From birth to death, just about every cell and function in the body is under hormonal regulation. Hormones are produced and secreted by glands when stimulated, which will then move through the blood until they come in contact with specific receptors on or in target cells. The binding of hormones to target receptors and the subsequent activation leads to a signaling cascade that ends with a desired effect be it activation of a set of proteins or gene expression. The main hormone producing structure in the body are the hypothalamus, pituitary gland, thyroid gland, parathyroid glands, pancreas, gonads, and adrenal glands. There are other structures in the body that also produce hormones, but I will hold off on listing them all here. Perhaps the most important structure in the endocrine system is the hypothalamus, which is located just below the thalamus and directly above the pituitary gland, which it controls. The hypothalamus is actually a dual structure as it is part of both the nervous and endocrine systems. In fact, the hypothalamus serves as a communication bridge between both systems. The hypothalamus receives input from a variety of sources stimulated by a variety of stimuli, and in return, it releases a variety of hormones. Five of these hormones are secreted into the hypophysial portal system, a capillary system that connects the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary gland. There are a total of five distinct three-part axes involving the hypothalamus, anterior pituitary gland, and distant endocrine tissues. This video will cover one of these axes, the hypothalamo-pituitary-somatotropic, or HPS, axis, also known as the growth axis. The HPS axis begins with the hypothalamus releasing the tropic hormone called growth hormone releasing hormone, or GHRH, into the hypophysial portal system. GHRH travels through the blood in the portal system, down the pituitary stalk, and into the anterior pituitary gland, where it binds to specific receptors on a specific group of cells called somatotrophs. Somatotrophs then release growth hormone, or GH, into the general blood circulation. To gain a good understanding of the importance of the HPS axis, and the roles of the hormones involved, it is helpful to know what stimulates the release of GHRH, thus initiating the HPS axis. The hypothalamus is stimulated to release GHRH under various nutritional states, such as when there is a high amino acid concentration in the blood, low glucose concentration in the blood, aka hypoglycemia, or low fatty acid concentration in the blood, aka hypolipidemia. In addition to these factors, sleep, the sex of an individual, and other hormones can all impact the production of hormones of the HPS axis. For example, GHRH production increases during deep sleep, which is when tissue rebuilding occurs. Males tend to have higher GHRH production, hence larger body size on average compared to females. Other hormones like testosterone, estradiol, and thyroid hormones increase GHRH production. 
All these factors that lead to increased release of GHRH from the hypothalamus will subsequently lead to increased release of GH from the anterior pituitary gland. Now that we have discussed a bit about what stimulates GHRH and GH production, let's take a closer look at GH, its targets, and its effects. As can be inferred by the name, GH promotes the growth of skeletal muscle, bone, and cartilages. It does so via two main pathways. The first pathway involves influencing metabolism. The second pathway involves influencing gene expression. Growth hormone directly affects metabolism in three main ways. First, GH stimulates the breakdown of glycogen reserves in the liver. as well as triglyceride reserves in adipose tissue. These processes are called glycogen lysis and lipolysis and will lead to the increased release of glucose and fatty acids into the bloodstream. Second, GH prevents glucose uptake in many tissues throughout the body that are not going to be involved in growth. Third, GH initiates gluconeogenesis in the liver, whereby glucose is made from non-carbohydrate sources, such as the fatty acids that are the products of lipolysis. Collectively, all these actions result in an increase in the amount of energy available for muscle and bone growth. We just discussed the effects of GH on metabolism. Let's now turn our attention to the effects of GH on gene expression. GH induces the transcription of genes for insulin-like growth factors, IGFs, inside the liver. Following the rules of central dogma, transcription of IGF genes will lead to mRNA for IGFs, which will then be translated into actual IGFs. IGFs are proteins with high structural similarity to insulin, which are part of a complex system that cells use to communicate with each other. There are two IGFs to focus on for the HPS axis and growth, conveniently named IGF-1 and IGF-2. IGF-1 secreted from the liver is transported through the blood and acts on skeletal muscle, bone, and cartilage, causing them to produce their own IGF-1. In skeletal muscle, the IGF-1 secreted by the myocytes acts on the very same myocytes that secreted it as well as on neighboring myocytes. IGF-1 initiates a signaling cascade in myocytes that will trigger the opening of specific channels in the cell membrane that allow amino acids to enter the myocytes. IGF-1 will also increase the uptake of glucose from the blood by increasing the number of GLUT4 transport proteins embedded in the cell membrane of myocytes. All the amino acids that enter can be used for muscle growth, aka muscle hypertrophy, while the glucose will provide the energy necessary for muscle growth. In bones, IGF-1 causes an increase in the activity of osteoblasts, bone-forming cells, and osteoclasts, bone-remodeling cells, while also increasing the synthesis of many proteins inside these cells, particularly collagen fibers. 
the result is an overall increase in bone mass. In cartilages, IGF-1 works in a very similar manner as it does in bone. This makes sense because cartilages in bone are derived from similar tissues that consist of somewhat similar cell types and collagen fibers. In addition to IGF-1, there is IGF-2, which works in a similar manner to promote growth and development. However, IGF-2 plays a more vital role during prenatal development, stimulating placental and fetal growth, apparently without the regulation of GH. To summarize, the HPS axis manages development and growth from early embryonic stages throughout childhood and puberty. Prenatally, it is IGF-2 alone that drives development and growth. However, from birth to puberty, it is GH and IGF-1 that mediate development and growth. After puberty, GH decreases in concentration as maximal body size has mostly been attained. Now, like everything good in life, there must be checks and balances. The body utilizes negative feedback loops for that purpose, to maintain homeostasis and ensure that growth is regulated and proper body dimensions are achieved. As GHRH concentration increases in the blood, it acts on the hypothalamus to decrease its own secretion. GH also takes part in a negative feedback loop signaling the hypothalamus to decrease the release of GHRH. Likewise, IGF acts negatively on the hypothalamus as well as the anterior pituitary gland to decrease the secretion of GHRH and GH respectively. In addition to these negative feedback loops, IGF works in a positive feedback manner to stimulate the secretion of somatostatin, also known as growth hormone inhibiting hormone from the hypothalamus. This hormone acts in opposition to GHRH, inhibiting somatotrophs from releasing GH. All these hormones and processes make up only one axis of the endocrine system merely providing a glimpse into the vastness of the endocrine system. I hope this video provided you with a good understanding of the HPS axis and a deeper appreciation for the functions of the endocrine system as well as the intricacies of the human body.